Hi, I'm John Peterson. You've just seen some of the new images of the Rubin Observatory. Now I'll talk a little bit about the capabilities of Rubin and tell you a little bit about the involvement at Purdue. I first worked on Rubin over 20 years ago. I built the simulator that Rubin used in the R&D and construction period and received um, six contracts over the years to do various tasks. If you look at the two images in this slide, you'll see the Rubin Observatory la last year on the left and on the right is an artist's impression of Rubin drawn with a simulation of the stars and galaxies in the background that I did many years ago. So this kind of kind of showed the long journey going from a concept on a piece of paper to the actual Rubin Observatory. Here are some key properties of Rubin. Rubin's an optical and near-infrared telescope. It goes from the U-band all the way to the Y-band. It's located in Sierra Pachon, Chile. It surveys essentially the entire southern sky every few nights, up to 24th magnitude. And it achieves a deep survey over 10 years, getting all the way to 27th magnitude. Rubin has a unique three-mirror design with three lenses and a filter. It has a giant 8.4 meter primary mirror um, with a tertiary mirror built into it for an effective size of 6.7 meters. It also features the largest astronomical camera ever made, uh, a three gigapixel camera that has 189 individual CCDs. Those CCDs will take a series of short exposures of 15 seconds. Probably the most important single key feature of the Rubin Observatory is its large field of view. It has a unique field of view that's over 10 square degrees. That's several times bigger than the full moon. This is achieved by its unique um, three mirror fast optical design. It's F1.1 design. This allows overall a short focal length, which makes the camera to be as small as possible even though it turns out it's the largest astronomical camera ever made. If you want to do a big survey, the most important quantity is something called Aton Dew. Aton Dew is the product of the telescope's aperture times the field of view. You can see by the table to the right, a series of other past survey telescopes, telescopes that were designed to do a large survey, and their Aton Dew compared to the Rubin Observatory. So in almost all cases, Rubin exceeds other telescopes by about an order of magnitude. Um, Aton Dew then tells how much light you collect from a survey per time. So it tells you how fast you can survey the sky and collect as much light as possible from all the stars and, and galaxies. So if you think about it, Rubin can do a survey in one year that other observatories would have taken 10 years. So over its 10 years, it will, will, will do something 10 times larger than many other surveys. One consequence of that large Aton Dew is that it, it has a very large data rate. So if you think about it, every 15 seconds, a three gigapixel camera will generate essentially tens of terabytes of data per night. To put that in perspective, even if you were to sit down and look at a TV screen all day long, and you looked at a 4K image every second, you'd actually be about 25 times too slow in keeping up with the data rates of Rubin. So that just highlights how you have to automate all the processing and no one really will be able to ever look at all the data individually. Another consequence of this fast survey is that there's really no point to individual proposals anymore since you can survey the whole sky every few nights. So that also means that the data will become public to the community after it's taken um, and people can do their individual science on whatever part of the data that, that they're interested in. Let me tell you a little bit about the Purdue involvement in the Rubin Observatory. There was some work done in developing the corner raft, which includes the guiders and wavefront sensors. And my group also built the simulator, which was used both in the R&D and the construction period of the project. This used a novel method simulating um, photons using a Monte Carlo approach, where you individually take photons from stars and galaxies and then model all interactions in the physics of the atmosphere, the telescope, and the sensor as the photon propagates through the system. This idea originally was thought to be impossible due to the high photon rates. If you think about um, how many photons come in from an optical telescope, especially one that's the highest Aton Dew telescope, is quite daunting. But Monte Carlo's can be quite efficient. A number of novel computational techniques we invented 
allowed it to be pretty fast to generate images, at least to a study where the possible problems could come from. This is increasingly more important with larger surveys because with more data, more objects, you can make more detailed measurements. Inevitably, there's going to be more and more systematics that come with making those measurements, so you have to understand more of the details probably than we ever understood before. So this, this approach proved very useful in the early stages of the project to pass the critical reviews to get the project approved, as well as to verify and do various studies on the design and various concepts um, as the project was started. Here's a movie of the photons from using the photon simulator co code called FOSIM. Here we start from a set of photons from stars and galaxies across the universe. And as you can see, they, they come across the universe, they propagate through the layers of turbulence in the atmosphere, then they hit the primary mirror. You saw before that the, the mirror being adjusted by the actuators. Um, and then they go into the lenses of the camera, only get through the, the blue filter. And then finally you see the, the photons ejecting photoelectrons in the silicon of the sensor. This simulation was done just to simulate a single star in a single galaxy. Um, but it can do this whole simulation in less than a millisecond. You can also see some of the physics behind this. You can see the, the atmospheric turbulence, the, the way we model it with a series of turbulent layers that are drifting across the Rubin telescope. Um, this has the consequence of um, blurring the images. You can see in the other movie um, an image of a star and the famous speckle pattern. This also causes the positions of stars to shift slightly and the ellipticity of objects to get slightly distorted across the field. It kind of correlates with the wind direction. Another important thing is the surface deformation on the mirrors. In this movie, you see the mirror shape of both the primary and tertiary mirror being um, corrected by the actuator system. This causes a number of effects that kind of blurs the images and causes astigmatism due to both thermal gradients across the, the mirror as well as the gravitational sag of the mirror itself um, from the support system. Another important part is the details of exactly how the sensors work. So in this simulation you can see the electric field lines um, generated by a slab of silicon. The electrons have to make it to the pixels and if these field lines aren't perfectly parallel, they end up in slightly different pixels than you might expect them to be in. This causes various distortions of the image as well, as well as causing the usual charge diffusion in the detector. There are so many different pieces of physics in these kinds of simulations. You can see a huge list of them in the green box on the right. And the challenge is to match those up with individual distortions or various systematics that you can see in images. And you can just see the complexity of the two. Here you can see how the individual physics connects to various um, image properties. We've also extended this um, code to simulate lots of other telescopes after starting with the Rubin Observatory. You can see both um, professional astronomy telescopes as well as amateur telescopes and even the human eye. So here's that original image you saw on the first slide, simulated image of what we thought we would see with Rubin with various stars and galaxies. In the background you can see a bright saturated star in the upper left and many other stars and galaxies throughout the image. Every single photon in this image has been ray traced through the full set of physics um, described on the previous slides. Here you can see an appreciation of even how many, how big uh, the 10 square degrees is, and even in a 15 second exposure, how many stars and galaxies you're truly collecting. So this is a full simulation. All the stars and galaxies and even the background has been simulated through the photon simulator. It totals about 10, 20 trillion photons. And as you zoom in, you can see, appreciate just um, how, how much data there is on the individual chips as well as zooming in all the way to see the individual stars and galaxies. Survey begins very soon. The data preview will be available to everyone at the end of the month. This covers an initial set of images. You'll talk more in the Q&A about um, individual science people are inter interested in at Purdue, but nearly any 
topic in astronomy is covered by the Rubin Observatory. So this includes finding all the near-Earth asteroids, making a 3D map of millions and millions of galaxies, uh, mapping the edges of the Milky Way and all the, as it's still forming today, um, finding about a million supernova every year, and along with that probably finding dozens of rare, interesting new objects we don't even know about, as well as answering some big questions and making precision measurements of, about dark matter and dark energy. Just about any astronomy topic um, can be covered by this comprehensive survey. It's an exciting time for Purdue physics and astronomy. We can all look forward to the images Ruben produces over the coming months.